Welcome back to another episode of the Space Salvi Institute podcast. I'm Andrew Pettiprin with Bobby Mixa. Bobby, how are you? Good, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm doing well, as always, uh, or almost always. I try to be well, by God's grace. And uh, today we have another guest. We've had we've we've just been stringing together some really wonderful conversations, and today I'm sure it promises to be among uh, among the best as well. We have Father Brian Graby. Interestingly, Father, you are our first priest guest, believe it or not. We, yeah. It's been a very lay, very lay-driven uh, endeavor thus far, but we're delighted that you're joining us as as our first uh, our first man in a collar to join us on the podcast. Uh, to our listeners, Father Brian Graby is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He's written for various publications. He's written a book, which is called, I wrote it down, Vessel of Honor, The Virgin Birth, and the Ecclesiology of Vatican II, which I don't have, but I'm going to have to pick that up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Father Brian Graby is also the host of the Breakfast podcast, a really wonderful podcast that we're going to talk about today. So, Father Graby, uh, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great and all the better for being here. Thanks so much to both of you for your kind invitation and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. I'm honored to be your first priest guest, so I hope I don't disappoint. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, you won't. No, you won't. Uh, let, let's get into it and talk about uh, your podcast, The Break Fast Podcast. Now, um, I uh, I encountered your podcast back in, I believe it was 2020 was when it when it first, the first season first came out, 2020 and 2021. And I, I wrote a, a very positive article about it back when Bobby and I both worked at Word on Fire. And I thought it was just such a wonderful um a, a wonderfully a wonderful podcast, a different take really on some really important kind of theological uh, themes and woven together with culture. You've come back recently with a second season. The first season we should say was mostly about food and drink. Or the first season was mostly about food and drink. The second season is about places. So give our listeners just a sense of where this came from that you decided to do this podcast and like really what's it about for you? Well, it came about in the most unexpected and, and really organic way. It's, it's not something I had ever thought I would do. Had I had no interest in doing it whatsoever. Uh, and sort of how it came about, there were um, two brothers who were parishioners of mine at the uh, Basilica of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral in, in downtown Manhattan. And I got to know them a little bit just chatting after mass. And, uh, you know, they said, oh, well, let's get dinner sometime. And so we, we set that up and three of us were out enjoying a nice meal. And talking about various common interests and they brought up the idea of doing a podcast and right away I said, no, no, you know, the last thing the world needs is another priest with a podcast. I thought <laughs> um, that's not something I could ever see myself doing, but they kind of pitched it in a very compelling way and made the case that this wouldn't just be more noise, which is what I really wanted to avoid. Um, these guys do this professionally. Um, so I knew it would be at a very high level of production, um, which proved to be correct. I mean, they make me sound better than I deserve. Uh, the studio where we record, you walk in and there's an, an Emmy award right there. And so, you know, you're dealing with, uh, with, with some real top, top line people there, but they had all the studies and background about format and length and demographic and release dates. I mean, they really, they know their stuff. And the way they pitched it to me was to kind of present some Catholic themes in a very approachable way through topics that are appealing and accessible and engaging that someone who would never otherwise listen to a Catholic podcast might see the topic, whether it's champagne or, um, you know, some, some dessert item, and, and it might just spark an interest and say, okay, let me check this out. They're about 18 to 20 minutes. It's very digestible. And we go into some backstories, so some cultural history, and then kind of ease into the meat of the episode, which, which is how that ties into some important aspect of our Catholic faith. And so the idea was that it's something that even nominal or fallen away or non-Catholics would listen to and, and find appealing, but also for, you know, your, your practicing Catholics, your, your 
very knowledgeable Catholics, they would still have something to chew on, something to um, benefit from, and all of it packaged again in in an attractive way. And I think that vision that they had has has proven to be correct. That it has tapped into what before then had had not really had a market in the you know podcast universe. No, that's brilliant. Um, Andrew, I mean, Andrew and I were talking a little bit about your approach. And so maybe, Andrew, you want to maybe say a little bit about, more about this. But I really like uh, that you take these concrete things that ha- that all have a cultural history and by way of that, then get into, like you said, the meat and then the, the present the gospel. Um, so like in, in, in our endeavor and focusing on Europe with all of these little all this cultural history there, it's stuff that people find appealing and want to go to and experience. There's just, that's really kind of in a way, not leaving this stuff behind, but like it opens you up to so much more. So it's it's almost kind of like this like ladder approach uh, where, you know, it's, it's it, it, it can lead to, if you want to say, metaphysical and theological depths that you never would have thought of before. And that's what was a real impetus behind this. It's it's sort of that aha moment in, in a way. And in the course of this discussion, I don't, I don't know how we got on it, but this is what gave rise to the uh, the title of the, of the podcast. We're just having to talk about how the word breakfast comes from the fact that Catholics up until rather recently in, in the grand scheme of things couldn't eat before they received communion. You know, the fast began at, at midnight. And so the first meal they would take was was after morning mass, and then they would break their fast. And he says, wow, like we use this word all the time, breakfast. I never ha- I had no idea it had any connection at all to the Catholic faith. And it was that sort of like almost a fun fact approach mm-hmm. that, okay, it's a neat little bit of trivia, but then it leads into a discussion, well, you know, why do we fast at all? What's the reason for that? And uh what does that, what is the church trying to teach us through that practice and discipline? And so, so that kind of became the model, the paradigm for how we wanted these episodes to, to be created. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's um, maybe overlooked sometimes how valuable, you know, you just use the word trivia, but like how valuable trivia is. I remember, you know, I, I you both know that I, I used to be an, an Anglican priest, an Episcopal priest before I was Catholic. And I remember when I was learning preaching, they said, you know, there are all these different intelligences, right? Like if you if you preach a sermon and you tell somebody the, the height of Mount Horeb, just as an aside, right, in your, in your sermon, strangely, people will, will, there are certain intelligences that will latch on to that, that figure and they will remember everything else you said, you know? And so I think like, and especially in this day and age, like I know that your, your show father is, um, you know, it's very, it sounds very much in the vein of something that you might've heard on national public radio, like 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe even still now, I'm not really sure, but that kind of you know, this American life uh, type of thing. And I always enjoyed listening to those shows because they just, you just learn things, you know? And and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like your approach is you're not necessarily trying to like smuggle the gospel in or whatever, but you're basically mm-hmm. just sort of describing, you know, like, you know, just describing the kind of sacramentality of of reality, you know? And, and there are these like sort of facts and figures that you can like attach to that. Like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know the origin of that word or I didn't know why that practice happened. And then people suddenly are like, oh, so it's just, it just, the world is this way. Uh, and the church, you know, the church is responsible to some degree for like why we even do a lot of the things that we do. Yeah. I think that was a very kind of deliberate, um, decision early on that as, as you said we're, we're not hiding anything it's it's very clear that's a catholic podcast um, i introduce myself as a priest uh every you know we, we make that all very clear from the outset but again it's it's not an in your face type thing it's it's not i we, we hope that it's not just dry theology that we we try to make it fun and and that's part of this approach too like it's a celebration of all good things that God has given us um, because everything ultimately comes from him and leads to him. And so whether it's different food and drink, um, 
and the traditions surrounding them, the history behind them, or in season two, famous places around the world, um, many of which have no uh, connection to the Catholic Church whatsoever. You know, one episode is on the Taj Mahal, for example. Um, it's, it's a um, Muslim tomb in a Hindu country. Uh, but nonetheless, trying to use some of the facts and figures, the background story of these places to lead us to understand our faith in a deeper way and, and maybe in a different way than we had before. No, fascinating. I, I always love it when um, somebody comes to Krakow for the first time and you they come because they want to go to Auschwitz and they also want to go to the salt mines. And if they're Catholic, maybe they want to go see some JP2 stuff. But just um, coming into the city and going to like Wawel and then getting kind of inducted into like the whole, in a way, Polish way of thinking about things with the kings, which they love their kings. And then the poets being buried right next to them in the cathedral there. Uh, it's just, it, it's to enter into the kind of, a, if you want to say like the line of the town, um, just really opens up then John Paul II in such a, I think, richer way to then understand kind of the depths of his thought, like the theology of his body, which was, you know, developed there, his interest in phenomenology. Um, and then also, too, some of the other traditions that people may kind of think about as like, oh, a nice little kind of relic of the past and people continue to do. But seeing that as like partially as continuing uh, handing on the faith to the next generation of Poles. So coming into the city, I just had uh, uh, met a couple of people at, uh, of all places, McDonald's in um, the <laughs> in the, the main square. And they were really, I overheard their conversation and they were really taken aback by the city itself. And they were debating whether or not they were going to go to these other places that they plan, but just they wanted to spend much more time in the actual place. So when I saw season two and all of these actual places, I started kind of rethinking some of uh, my approaches to teaching kids history um, as just focusing on one, like you said, Andrew, taking the trivia of the place. So I have to do I have to do Greece tomorrow with uh, with 13 year olds. And so I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to take the Parthenon uh, exactly what you did and just focus in on on that instead of getting into all this other information about that, perhaps that may be a latch on. And I, I think just to exactly what you're, you're speaking to there, there's um, one of the things we've tried to impart is sort of a, the breadth of, of the scope there. You know, you're mentioning these different cities and people coming from all over. Uh, the, the, broad expanse and reach and applicability of the Catholic faith, which which is universal, right? Jesus is the savior of, of all mankind. Um, this is a truth meant for everyone in every state of life and everything in this world can and should lead us somehow to God as I mentioned before. But I, I, I think that's an important corrective or antidote to so what's out there in, in just terms of the atmosphere that, that people breathe in, at least in a, you know, a city like New York, where the faith to the extent that people have it and, and practice it, it's very easy to compartmentalize that, to, to pigeonhole it. You know, this is something I do at best for an hour on Sunday, and then I kind of get on with my secular life. And that division exists in so many ways, and, and this is not to, to get political or controversial, but, but we hear these dichotomies, right? Um, faith and science, uh, church and state, the public and the private. And I think one of the things we're trying to impart is, is that this is not just some hobby or interest, you know, on the part that maybe you also collect stamps. Uh, this should inform your entire outlook on on everything this is the lens through which reality must be seen and understood and it's bringing in all of these various elements to try to illustrate the universal scope of and, and the richness of, of our faith there and to your point father i was 
listening again to the first episode of of this second season where you talk about Central Park. And I every time I am in New York, I I love go, going to Central Park. I think it is just one of the most special places in the world. And the way that you talk about it is really is really wonderful because again, you know, whether someone is a Catholic or not, a Christian or not, um, to be able to think about the most valuable real estate on the planet Earth set aside for the sake of leisure is like a deeply metaphysically rich idea. And so like to to live in a city that is like extremely secular, very focused on making money, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is, but then to understand that you have this place within it, um, it, it, it reframes your whole way of thinking about where you are in the world. And um, maybe you could comment on that, but I thought I would just also uh, carry, carry this forward that, um, you know, in the new season, you have uh, lots of different places, the Grand Canyon, the Taj Mahal, you mentioned, um, you know, several other places, but you have a number of them. I think, I think it's half of them or nearly half, three, three or four of them are based in New York. And I noticed in the first season as well, you had a lot of kind of New York content. And that was something that I really appreciated because, you know, I myself am something of an anywhere man or a nowhere man or something like that. And I, I really appreciated how you, how your affiliation with New York, like really comes through in the way that you're talking about these places and these foods and these drinks and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I don't know, just maybe open-ended, like, what does New York mean to you? Like, what's it like to minister there, to be there? It's it's you feel like the whole world is here in in miniature in, in microcosm. Uh, there's there's really no place like it. Um, I, and that might sound like a cliche, uh, but I, I think you have a cross section of humanity here that you just don't find anywhere else on on Earth. And I love that. Um, diversity that richness that that vibe i mean you hear that thrown around all the time there's just an energy here in new york city that i i i i've never experienced anywhere else and there's also something just so iconic about it that that even people who have never been to new york can can relate to it because it's just so widely filmed and photographed and um spoken about in in people's travels and experiences i remember one time i was in a i was over in rome for a number of years completing my doctorate in theology and was in one little town for the weekend that i had been visiting and struck up a conversation with the shopkeeper and, and she asked where i was from and I, I said new york city and the phrase she used was very beautiful she said oh the place of dreams mm -hmm. and i thought wow isn't that something that that you know we we even here in the 21st century, it still occupies this place in the imagination that I think um, is so alluring. I, I mentioned a priest friend of mine from England um, in one of the, the episodes. It was his first time ever in New York City, his first time ever in America. Um, and the day he arrived, you know, we went around the neighborhood a little bit, got some dinner and I said to him, we were going to head back to the rectory. And I said, you have to see Times Square. I mean, it's it's your first day in New York. And that's a place I would, I avoid like the plague. I mean, you just don't <laughs> want to be walking through there, especially in the evening with, with all the shows letting out. Um, I mean, it's just this massive humanity. Um, but he said, you have to, especially at night, you have to see all the lights and everything. And we got, they were sitting in the middle of Times Square and he's just like a kid in a candy store. He's like, I can't believe I'm here. Um, this is just wild. Like, no movie scene can can capture what it feels like to be standing right here and it, it was really neat to be able to experience that through his eyes someone seeing this for the first time and so i think there's just a relatability to new york city that you know many people in the world can appreciate um and it's just a place i love very deeply that i've spent you know a great part of my life in and um just thrilled to share that with others to the extent that I can. Yeah, New York. Oh, everybody here, even in Poland, I mean, they talk about in one place they want to go outside of uh, Europe is New York City. And uh, you're right, walking in Times Square, it's electrifying. Um, I, I can, I've been there a couple times. And I always am a little bit jealous of New York because I'm, I'm from... Um, 
sorry, I'm from Chicago. And so, you know, I, it's, it's a little bit, um, I've always tried to kind of, you know, make Chicago out to be a little bit better than New York, but I do know that New York has an advantage. Yeah, the world, the whole world is there. Um, but yeah, that uh, to find, uh, what was it that you said that struck me about, uh, about Times Square, the mass of humanity being there. There's something so enjoyable about just kind of being in the place where, there's so many people just to watch and look at. Um, I don't know. There's it's, it kind of takes you out of yourself. Like very enjoyable with a, a town that's like a ghost town. I remember going in Chicago when uh, COVID, we were, like the lockdowns were still in place, and I mean it was just absence of like spirit and soul. But once the people started to get back on the streets, it was like it came alive again. And I think you touch upon. A, a common thread throughout all of these episodes. And, and I'll preface it by saying, just building on that, the Times Square um, motif there, you know, coming out of a show or whatever, or connecting to a train, you, if you happen to find yourself trying to get through Times Square on, you know, a weekend evening, it can be really frustrating, right? Right. The horde of tourists taking selfies with Elmo and it's like, oh my gosh, just get me through <laughs> here kind of thing. But there are those, moments maybe you're waiting at a light across the street and you look and there's all the you know lights and billboards and signs and you just sort of pinch yourself and say this, this is really cool like it's just so cool to be here and i remember when i was over in rome a conversation came up i had, I had been there a number of years at that point and you walk past the Colosseum or saint peter's basilica on on you know a daily basis and one of the fellows who was who was over there studying um, had a comment that came across like a little blase, like, oh yeah, I don't even notice that anymore sort of thing. And I thought to myself, like, how sad, like the day I walk past St. Peter's and don't think how amazing this is, is, is a really sad day. And I think the common thread I, I was referring to is, is just this sense of wonder and awe and appreciation at this world we live in. It's a very Chestertonian theme, right? right? The, the ethics of, of fairyland, not being so dulled and, and, and taking for granted just this amazing, beautiful world that God has made, whether, and you know, season one with the food and drink, season two with these places, to retain that sense of being able to be awed, being able to be impressed because it's very humbling like there is something greater than you here in this equation and to just surrender to that and and open your heart to it is the way in which we ultimately surrender to and open our heart to the creator of all this himself yeah well said and i think that really um that comes through in, in so many of your episodes uh, something I wanted to ask you about was I was I was listening to the last season or the last episode of season one again the the episode called Break Fast and that one is one I would recommend to our listeners who are uh, who maybe maybe even start with that episode I, I almost would recommend just because that seems mm -hmm. to be where you really you really get into kind of why the pro why the project you know and mm -hmm. to me the thing that stood out was something that Bobby and I have talked a lot about in our in our little venture here at the Space Alvey Institute is religion as the basis of culture. You know, that these yeah. things that you're talking about, food and drink and places and all these kinds of things, these aren't just kind of like nice things to kind of occupy us until until our we die and our souls float off to heaven, right? I mean, this is like, this is all a part of the gift of our lives, you know, and sort of the way that we interact with material reality and, and all these sorts of things. And so it's no surprise then that... Um, you need religion as kind of the engine of all of that stuff. So I don't know, maybe if you could say something about that, just the, this this idea of religion as the basis of culture. Yeah, it's funny, as, as you're describing all that, you know, very well and, and, and insightfully, the image or phrase that came to mind is um, MGM Studios has as their logo, Ars Grazia Artis, art for art's sake. And when I started to become aware enough of, of these issues, arts and culture, I came to realize early on that, that that's 
a very wrong statement. Right? The, the art does not exist for art's sake. The purpose of art is not just to have it in itself. Um, it is to lead us to God. Um, Dante calls art the, the grandchild of God because God creates us and we create art. And when we see art, we should see God reflected in it. Um, it, it, it so, so all great art should be a, a school of, of virtue that ennobles our soul. And so I mention all that because I think it speaks directly to, to your point, which is that these things don't just exist for their own sake. You know, it's not just a beautiful building or a, or a yummy meal. Um, that's ultimately meaningless. It's, it's like a little diversion that, if, and, and if that's all we have in this life, you know, it, it, it can easily induce despair. Um, what, what's the point of all this? Why even bother? It's only when we see all of that in the context of, of God and his creation that then it, it comes into itself and, and assumes its rightful purpose as a means to an end, that it exists for the sake of, of our union with God and the degree to which it helps us affect that union means it is then that it has all the more value and, and relevance and nobility of purpose as a result. That, that's, you know, I just thought immediately of another New Yorker, uh, Woody Allen uh, in Annie Hall in the beginning, you know, when, you know, what's his name? Would, he's not doing his homework and his mother goes to the doctor to tell him to do his homework. And he says, well, what's the problem? Right. Well, you know, it's the universe it has something to do with the universe, right? Yeah, the uh, universe is expanding. Yeah, <laughs> and if it's expanding, then there soon be nothing. Um, when I was, I thought that was, I thought that connection of kind of cosmology, um, all the ultimate things, like where everything's going, and educate not doing your homework was perfect. Um, and so I was always thinking, okay, well, what could we? How could? Is there a way of connecting? say, education and say, the eschaton ultimately, and perhaps if you are not presenting, say, an ultimate vision of where it's all heading that is, is, is say, a hopeful vision, like the beatific vision, you think of, you brought up Dante, um, but yet it's, it's leading to nothing, which seems to pervade a lot of education today, um, then why even do your homework? Uh, so... Right. Yeah, it it seems like and what you just pointed to is, co is connecting to all that stuff is just uh, it's it's so amazing how it's all connected like that. I just have to mention as a side note. So it was only a couple weeks ago. I'm walking down the street and I look at the person walking towards me. And I said, "That's funny. That guy's trying to dress up like Woody Allen." <laughs> no, that is Woody Allen. So oh man! It's just like you. You just never know. You never know. Oh wow! But it was it was kind oh. of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't bother him but it but it was me just to see like oh there he is and he looks exactly like you'd expect Woody Allen to look <laughs> like but yeah I, I I think you know Bobby we were saying there is the one episode probably in the last season that I think speaks to that most directly is is the Grand Canyon episode just the, the grandeur of of this world and I was speaking to a friend of mine who had recently been out there and was one of the 99 percent I mentioned who only you know see it from from the top there from the rim and he was mentioning even at that, he said he looked out and tears came into his eyes. And I think that's the purpose of all anything that is good and true and beautiful should um, elicit a, 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 some, some reaction to, to some degree like that, that we recognize something beyond ourselves and how important that is in a world in a culture that is so much about being consumed with oneself you know to open ourselves beyond that is is very necessary and and very powerful yeah um uh, another thought i had i think maybe i'm mistaken i thought maybe somewhere in one of your episodes you you talked about maybe it's in the grand canyon when you talked about i maybe i'm completely misremembering but talked a little bit about conservation and like am i misremembering that i don't I remember so. But um, I, I think that was that episode. Yes. 
Okay. The point that I, I thought so, because, you know, as Bobby was talking, I was thinking about how we have the, you know, this phenomenon now where people who purport to care about the earth, right, who are like environmentalist activists destroy or try to destroy works of art, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, and it's like this weird kind of nihilism that's baked into this purported concern for the future, you know, whereas like there's a kind of old fashioned conservation mentality, which is just like, the world the world is good god gave it to us we need to care for it right and and that's yeah. instantiated right like in my community we we clean up or like we go to the grand canyon and we we are called back to ourselves to remember that you know the world is beautiful and it's worth like looking after or whatever rather than just this sort of theoretical you know kind of thing that can only be solved by people who are smarter than anyone else on the planet who can do the math and tell us what to turn off and turn on and all of that sort of thing yeah, there's there's a balance. There, there's there's a right and proportionate approach to these things that I think we we can only strike through the lens of of the Catholic faith right? because it's it's the fullness of truth. And so, as you're describing, you know, on the one hand, right, we we don't worship nature by by any means, but on the other hand, we should be deeply bothered at seeing someone litter like like that, just brazen disregard for god's creation um and yeah as you mentioned these things just and i mentioned this in the, in the episode too they it's so easy to devolve into political polarization on on these topics and that that's not what any of this is about it, it, it is about how we ought to look at these matters um and strike that balance so that all of these things, whether it's, it's nature or art or whatever it might be, are we approach them in the right way and they help us to become better, uh, to become better people, better Catholics as a, re as a result too, because we see where they've come from and where we want to go as a result of our interaction with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you guys were talking, I was thinking of in the in the book of Genesis, um, there's just those first couple chapters, you get so much of like the right approach to a lot of these questions, it seems like, uh, first of all, man being placed in the garden uh, as the priest, kind of the king, you know, almost the, the priest, but also to tend the garden in a way. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the, the national parks. And sometimes it seems like baked it too into the national park mentality is like, okay, we've got this thing that we do have to preserve, but almost as if human beings could potentially, you know, and they do, right, destroy it. But it seems that like a, with a lot of environmentalists, it's just that human beings themselves are bad. And it would just be better if, if, if you know, nature just could go on without human beings because they're so corrupting of that. Um, and then it just also too, with like you mentioning the arts for art's sake, but also art for, for the sake of, of worshiping God. Um, it's, it, it's interesting. And I could be completely wrong on this, but if you look at like the genealogy from like Cain and all the different like things, the inventions that come about like tubular Cain, and then all the music is I think thrown in there. And you think, okay, well, maybe I could see all those things as bad, perhaps. Uh, but they will all be taken up then eventually to add, to partake in that in that worship. So I could be completely wrong, but I think I remember reading something by uh, the Jacques Elou, something on like the the meaning of the city, in which he he goes back to Genesis and answers a lot of these questions today, um, where we have the tendency, right, to kind of uh, divide things up where he kind of unites them so sorry i just <laughs> thought i'd mention that i'm going off on us uh on my own little tangent there no and there's a lot there i mean and this is you know maybe something even in future episodes if we could build her on um but the whole kind of theology of the city you know which in its ideal form is a reflection of the city of god right the, the polis where all of humanity is 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 gathered in its as we recount Times Square in its in its diverse splendor. Um and, and you know, when all the, the, the saints come marching in, they, you know, Flannery O'Connor's here comes everyone type thing. 
um, how how beautiful the city should be as that uh, precursor to the heavenly Jerusalem, um, but also the elevating and ennobling aspect. And I'm, I'm going to speak, you know, probably a little bit out of my element here, but the, the little exposure I've had to some of the, um, you know, theory, architectural theory or whatever, but in, in oftentimes Renaissance city planning, the park or the garden is that kind of um, recreation of Eden in a way where it's not, um, it's, it's retaining nature, but it's not, it's not the wilderness. It's not beyond the city walls. It's uh, cultivated and arranged and tended. And so it's nature that has been elevated as a result of man's imprint and interaction with it. And that ought to serve as a blueprint for how we approach anything, right? We, we don't destroy it. We take what's there and make it better. And that's what God does with us, right? I mean, that that's the whole, um, all through the Gospels, right? Jesus takes water and makes it wine. He takes wine and makes it his own precious blood. He takes us, you know, conceived in sin and, and divinizes us to share in his eternal divine life. And and so all of this is just so connected in a really rich and beautiful way. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And this comes through in all your episodes, just this really... Uh, I hope anyway that we're at a moment in in the life of the church where we're really um it, it bothers me in some ways that we don't have maybe your typical your typical Catholic may not have as great an appreciation for what the resurrection means as as mm. as they should. You know, and I think like you Bobby, what you said, and then again what you've said, Father, this you know, th this um, this taking up, this divinizing, this sort of, you know, um, this continuing to grow into this this image and likeness, um, you know, that our bodies, the stuff around us, like this stuff isn't destined for the trash can. It's, it's destined for resurrection. And, you know, this yeah. is, um, I think, by highlighting uh, the goodness of of creation in, in your episodes, that really comes through. One that I wanted to ask you about, though, is in the new season— I felt a strong desire to go to all of these places that you that you talk about. Most of them I'd been to before, actually, but um, to go back or to go back to. But um, the one episode that is a little different is your episode on Auschwitz, because yeah. the other, you know, the other episodes I really and and in the first season too, you get there's a lot of delight that comes through. You know, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of joy in the goodness of God's gift of creation and and the gift of these places and 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 all of that sort of thing. But Auschwitz is almost like a kind of, you know, it's almost the antithesis of, or it offers kind of the the opposite thing in a sense um, than a lot of the other places that you mentioned. Namely, it it offers you the opportunity to talk about God's presence in what feels like God's forsakenness. And I really, I really enjoyed that. I have to say, it didn't really make me want to go to Auschwitz. I haven't been there. But where did? Why did you decide to include Auschwitz? I, I, I just thought that was a really, it was very. Actually, I just thought kind of courageous of you to put that in there alongside these other topics. I appreciate that, uh, and and this engendered quite a bit of discussion in, in mapping out the second season um, because we knew that was going to be a very um, heavy episode, a, a very a sensitive episode to handle and it's one that we you know made sure we wanted really to strike the right note on i you know how did it come about i i think of all the places in the world i've been blessed to visit i don't know that any place has impacted me as powerfully as auschwitz has it, it, it's just it's the type of place you can never quite forget um and realizing what happened there and and the scale of evil i thought if we're talking about places that that are important or that carry some meaning i i don't know how i could omit that it would almost like be turning a blind eye to it and I think it speaks to such a universal theme and, and challenge, which is the problem of evil. And so many people struggle with their faith because of that problem, that question, you know, where is God in this? Why, why did he allow this to happen? 
um, we've all experienced pain and loss in, in, in various ways and to various degrees. And I, I just thought it's such an important topic to talk about and there's no place on earth that can be the catalyst for that discussion and then the place that is the site of, of arguably you know the greatest evil the world has, has ever seen um and in the midst of right you as you said most of these episodes are very um joy-filled uh we, we the the Phil on the team who does all of our our sound work, the audio work, he's he's really brilliant, Josh Canavari, and he's the one who early on, you know, did kind of the theme music and that outro theme music. It, it's so celebratory, and I, I think captures the spirit of the podcast. You know, you you, I like to think the listener finishes on, on a high. Like I feel better about the world and my life and myself because I listen to this, you know, twenty minute podcast. And you know, Auschwitz is, is it's not that it's not a happy episode. Um, but I think still there's that note of hope, right? And that's why we kind of concluded with with Maximilian Kolbe that that there's still a light in the darkness. That that even in the place of greatest evil, God is there. And you know this this was like the devil's best shot. Um, and and even there, that that light still shines. That candle still burns. And we can't pretend that evil didn't happen. But we can see that it doesn't have the last word. And even though perhaps in someone's moment of suffering right now in this life, even listening to that episode, that happy music might sound like a false note or an off key. Um, that's what's waiting at, at the end of the episode of our life. And I think that's what we try to point to in the midst of, of that very difficult discussion. Hmm. I could be wrong, but does uh, Sp Steven Spielberg have Schindler's List end with uh, the um, uh, Boy Should Kill Our Exodus music? Um, there's a see. I'm just thinking of the music even that ends that. Um, anyways, it's because that music, the Exodus, if you should go, I recommend everybody go listen to it. Boy Should Kill Our, who uh, actually is, uh, grew up in a place right by Auschwitz. Um, and it just it kind of it ha it's it's almost as if you're with, you know, the chosen people marching out of Egypt, but yet they're overcoming it and entering through that though into the promised land. Um, but yeah, Auschwitz. I mean, my gosh, um, it's almost like you're it's kind of with you said the presence of God. Sorry, I have not listened to this episode yet, but I'm going to. But it's but being there, it's like you, you're just full of this reverence. I mean, I've never seen so many people, like even more so than in a church. I mean, they're just in total silence, but in a reverential silence. Um, and, you know, you never, you, the whole day, I remember somebody, uh, there's, these people at McDonald's said, they'll go do this after Auschwitz, they'll go do this after Auschwitz. And then that I said, no, you you have to it your whole day just has to be at Auschwitz. You can't do anything after that. Um, because it's just it, it, you're not going to the theater right after no. a day at Auschwitz. <laughs> it would seem to be like that would seem to be like um, you know, kind of a immoral thing to do. Um yeah, almost, almost disrespectful, right? Yeah, almost disrespectful, yeah. yeah. Almost in the same vein though. Yeah. No, go ahead, Father. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I haven't seen Schindler's List since it first came out in, in theater, so I, I don't remember you know, much of the details, but just hearing you recount about the music there, I, I believe if memory serves, the very beginning and very end of the movie, there's there's like a a match being struck and, and, and a candle being lit. Um, you know, it's like part of, I, I think it was part of a Holocaust remembrance service that bookends the movie, but but that same idea of the light shining you know in the darkness not overcoming it um and right oscar schindler um gave gave hope that that there's still goodness um in the face of of evil and that goodness that goodness triumphs and so yeah um but anyway andrew i'm sorry you were gonna say 
Oh, well, now, now I just very quickly, I'll just add this. It, actually, in Schindler's List, the two, if you remember, the two places where there's little flashes of color are one, there's the girl with the red coat. And the second was when, that, yeah. was when the, um, the employees are given permission to celebrate, um, to keep the Sabbath, I guess, for the first time, like after Schindler brings them to his factory and he gives them more freedom than they've had, um, they light a candle and the candle is, is, mm is the candle color not in black and white as well and so i think that that makes the point that that you were just saying you know um to to maybe to to flip it back around to kind of the more positive um i don't know not that we weren't being positive but maybe <laughs> it's a little morose to to keep talking about auschwitz but but as you said bobby you know um if you do something so if you if you experience something so um so sad so you know just i don't know how you would even describe that experience you can't you can't just easily go do something else but in a way the the flip side really is true or should be true as well and you know you father you some of these places where you take us in your podcast are, are places where we really should dwell longer than we do we might we might be tourists in paris and go to the saint chapelle for you know who knows how long in this throng of people and not not really not really take it in. And, you know, I, I think Bobby and I have talked about this before that there, there's such a market these days for people going online and, you know, experiencing, like maybe they'll go somewhere, but they'll go online and they'll kind of, kind of experience it some more, or maybe they'll experience it a bit online and then they'll go to the place yeah. and they'll, they'll be able to have that experience. And it seems to me that your show, this second season could serve that purpose for some people. I don't know if that's at all what you had in mind, but it, I, it for me, it helps I think it helps kind of intensify the the good the goodness too, like the kind of the transcendent uh, quality of some of these places. Which, if you're just a tourist and you just go there, you may not really get to experience in their fullness. There's some statistic, and I don't have the exact numbers, but of of all the people who go into the Louvre Museum, I make a beeline for the Mona Lisa, take a selfie in front of it, and exit the museum. Uh -huh. Right. I, it's like of this incredible, like arguably the greatest museum in the world. They're going to see one work of art, most famous work of art in the world for sure. But they look, but they do not see. And it's just kind of this um, selfie stick uh, tourism checklist. And how much we're missing out on. Um, and I don't know why this, is, you know, going from sort of the sacred to the profane, this reference just popped into my head. But Ferris Bueller's line at the beginning of of the movie, they're like, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. And I, I, I think there is a strong element of that in in these podcasts. And certainly, I, I think in what should be our approach to life is kind of savoring these things, right? Savoring the good things that life offers because we are all so busy we're easily distracted we're pulled in so many directions and it can be very easy to live our life like those tourists in the louvre um get it done check it off the list move on to the next thing and taking time wasting time you know that leisure episode in central park wasting time with god that's what worship is wasting time with with our friends and families in in recreation and enjoying a good meal together and in, in going to some place together whether it's a pilgrimage or a, a vacation, um, that's the best that life has to offer and really is the foretaste of heaven because then there are no means to an end. We're not doing this for the sake of something else. We're doing this because this is good in itself. It is good to worship God. It is good to be together and laugh together with those whom we love. And so often we that gets short shrift, right? We're on to being more um, productive, more utilitarian things. And we miss out um, on, on what God wants us to enjoy and, and savor as a foretaste of what he has ready for us. And yeah, so that's a long way of saying, I, I think you are exactly right and touch on a really, really important aspect of, of what these episodes speak to. We'll have to eventually have, um, you know, maybe Father Gravy, you can come on too with with Philip Best to talk about some of these things. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Philip Best. He's an architect and architectural historian from uh, Notre Dame. And he also has a degree in theology from uh, Harvard, but he wrote a book called Till We Til We Have Built Jerusalem. And it brings all of this together. He brings Aristotle together with 
you know, theology, but saying how ultimately, you, yeah, it's like we build for the sake of this, 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 and this. But at the end of the day, there has to be a contemplative dimension to the city, yeah. like a square, you know, in which you have something like ultimately, I mean, I'm thinking about the main square in Krakow, which is you, yeah. you have all of these, you know, activities, okay, shopping, dining, all that stuff. But at the very, like, not at the very, well, actually at the center, you do have the adoration, but then you have St. Mary's there. Um, and actually Marian imagery, I've looked, I've, I've actually paid attention and tried to find as many images of Mary I could find in the city. And um, in the, in the center there, in the, in the main square, you find this Marian imagery all over. And I just think, okay, well, if the mat, if it's called St. Mary's, and it's in the major rinnick. Is there is this kind of incarnation? Like we have the Eucharist, Saint Mary's. It's as if, in a way, like the incarnation is coming to this the town itself. Um, I have this weird theory that, and some Krakovians have laughed at me for thinking this. But if you go on Google Maps and you flip Krakow, um, you know, facing you know up, up is south, and you know the bottom is is north. So just you flip it it kind of looks like a, a human body, but something like it kind of has like a feminine, almost pregnant woman dimension to it. And I I know everybody thinks I, I'm, I'm crazy for saying this here, but when you look at the city with all this kind of Im imagery of Mary around there and you think, okay, bobbles the head, the stomach, uh, which is like the market, the main square, but the heart could also be, the the heart is is has this Marian dimension, and I was I'm always wondering if perhaps you said in a Renaissance they built cities uh, to kind of reflect the human um, human excellence in activity, but also the human form. Um, I wonder if maybe Krakow has this like almost Mary Mary is giving shape to the city. So I don't know. This may be a wacky idea, but do you have any any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, how beautiful if so. And there is something very, um, there's something very profound in the Catholic imagination of these cities where the main square, right, is a place for people to gather. It's it's where we are, are collected. I mean, the colonnade of St. Peter's obviously illustrates that probably better than anything. But all of these cities have a, have a common space. And this is why, and this is getting into a whole nother, um, topic but the kind of dehumanization of suburban sprawl and, and all this where there is no place to gather we are all just so isolated and and cut off and atomized but in the so if the town square is the heart of the city the heart of that square is is the church is the cathedral right god is is it's a very clear message it's a message in stone that that we all are together here and what brings us together and keeps us together is God is is the incarnate Christ as you're as you're talking about represented here in this church, and everything flows from that. Um, everything radiates out from that center, that that nerve center of of truth and faith. And so, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Well, Father, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Listening to the podcast, I I already had a sense that I kind of felt like I knew you, and then you and I have had a chance to talk on the phone uh, before today, but but uh, all the more so now that we've had this uh, this conversation. It's just really wonderful to to um, to hear what you have to say uh, and to learn more about this uh, this really great project that you have undertaken. And I hope very soon, maybe we'll get to meet in the flesh and and enjoy a bottle of wine together, or uh, you know, enjoy the riches of God's creation, and uh, you know. Um, live together as as brothers, I suppose uh, the way the way the way we're supposed to. But uh, anyway, uh, Father Brian Graby, thank you so much for uh, joining us today on the podcast, and we hope to have a chance to talk to you again soon. Absolutely, it was my pleasure. Thanks both so much for the conversation, and I hope to, we can continue it as well. Absolutely. To any of our listeners, please do uh, subscribe and share this episode. Uh, check out our website, spacealbiinstitute.com. Sign up for our email so you don't miss our articles and uh, the podcasts that we share from there. We're excited for uh, a lot of new 
uh, activity in our organization this year. So until next time, God bless and live in hope.